Hey folks, Dust here, and this is going to be episode 21 of my show called The Hype, and most of you probably have never seen this before because I haven't done an episode in a very long time, but it's a show that I brought uh, out in 2014 and ran 20 episodes pretty regularly, then I took a huge break, but I'm trying to see if I can't bring it back, and to do that, I'm going to be talking with Peacemaker from Tempo Storm, and this show is kind of a, a hybrid between interview and, and kind of a talk show discussion of certain topics, so it's going to be a bit back and forth, but I think you'll enjoy it. And first off, uh, just, hi, Peacemaker. How's it going? Yeah, pretty good. How are you doing? Yeah, I guess you guess you must be feeling pretty good, right? Title <laughs> in the books now, the trophy there uh, from the event just this past yeah. weekend. Yeah, actually, like, we didn't feel better. <laughs> And, uh, of course, you guys are actually leaving tomorrow for DreamHack Awesome Record this night before you guys leave for that. So I know you guys have a busy schedule. Um, yeah. But actually, to kick off this interview, I want to rewind a long way back. Um, okay. And I'm not sure how much you knew a lot of these guys back in this time period that I'm going to go to. But we'll just, we'll just see what happens when I ask these questions. Okay. Um, so back in 2014, this is probably around October. So this is a, a pretty long time ago, you know, a year and a yeah. half ago. Uh, yep. Guys like Hen1 and Lucas, who are on your team right now, were playing with a team yep. called Kaboom, and they went to ESWC 2014, and they had Fallen and Fur on that team as well with them. Yeah, uh, I remember. And, you know, obviously that things didn't really go well for them there. This was kind of one of those periods where Brazil wasn't very big. We didn't really see them doing a whole lot. But my question would be is, where were you during all this time? Like, what were you up to? Yeah, like... Back in the day, at 2014, I was like playing Counter Strike, like kind of for fun in Brazil, like for a couple of teams, played some tournaments, and I was working as well, like doing other stuff in Brazil. So I was, I, I was like watching the competitive scene, like following the teams and all that, because I always loved Counter Strike, but like nothing like really professional, you know. Right, I got you. Um, so obviously, after that event going into 2015, before. Uh, the MLG X Games Aspen event, which kind of kicked off 2015, where some of the guys yeah. on Kaboom kind of made a name for themselves, right? And they had these crazy Mirage wins that they got against yeah. uh, Cloud9, and then they also beat Fnatic at this event Fnatic. called ClutchCon, uh, which is like yeah. a smaller North American event that I was actually casting at uh, that happened right after X Games Aspen, and then obviously they, they go on to rise. But my question here would be is, obviously Kaboom went through a big roster change where guys like Lucas and Hen1 were removed from the team. That's whenever you saw them bring in steel bolts and zqks um yeah. do you know any of the reasons behind why this happened like did you have any insight yeah into that? yeah like what i heard it was like it was pretty much like that um they tried that lineup for like a long time and uh yeah like i said they played eswc and a couple tournaments with that lineup and uh i feel like fnx was not like really focused like to play professionally so actually they like wanted to like take him out and uh, together with that um, it was uh, yeah Lucas and Henny I think that they a kind of lack of experience from them and they wasn't performing that good so because it was like their first tournaments the international tournaments and uh, yeah so they wanted to like r that roster change and but together with this they had the opportunity to bring like steel boats and DQK and make like an international team that and with like a lot of sponsors so they could be able to like travel around the world and play all the big tournaments so i think it was like both you know like they were not satisfied with the lineup and uh, they had this opportunity to play more tournaments so yeah and i mean zqk was it still is a really good player both like a really talent same with T steel so yeah i think at that time probably they made the right decision Right. So obviously this Kaboom team turns in the keyed stars for a little while. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, they wind up becoming Luminosity. And then, of course, they go through more roster changes, obviously, with Bolts being removed from the team as well as Steel. And now you have Bolts and they bring in Cold Zera. Uh, yeah. And they have these different moves. And, of course, throughout the year 2015, they keep growing and growing and growing. And they eventually have some pretty big tournament finishes and all that good stuff. Uh, but my question to you would be is like once again when all this was taking place throughout the year 2015 and before that Games Academy Golden Chance thing happened which built yeah. up the Games Academy team that will become Tempo Storm again like what were you up to like before when I asked you what you were up to in 2014 you said you were just kind of playing casually yeah. and keeping up as kind of a fan but 
where did you finally make your transition into like taking the game seriously and like putting yourself in position to eventually be a coach for this team? Yeah, like, like Zeus from Luminos, the coach from Luminos, always being like a really good friend of me, and uh, he was like always telling me that being a coach like is really good, and uh, like he knows me and he knows what I what I like to do, and he was like, yeah, you should definitely like take care, start to like think about being a coach one day and things like that so after uh, at the beginning of 2015 and uh, like in the middle of 2015 I was already like watching a lot of demos like you know watching all the tournaments and also I was playing for a team called Dai Dai in uh, Brazil so I was playing tournaments as well like you know like I was keep playing just so I don't get like dust you know and uh, things like that so I was like uh, starting to focus on like trying to be professional one day again, and uh, and then that's what I pretty much that's pretty much what I did. But uh, I was following Kate Stars, Kaboom, Illuminosity like the beginning, and uh, yeah, that's it. Right. So this thing comes around called the Golden Chance uh, with Games Academy, which is how these guys were able to move into North America and eventually yeah. kind of start building themselves up. This is, of course, back when you guys still had Taco and FNX on the team with Lucas yep. and Hen One and, and Bolts. Um, I mean, what what did this mean for you guys? Like when I, I mean, I know you weren't a technically a coach yet. It wasn't until later on down the line. But I mean, you were you know aware of these players. But I mean, what what did you think of this whole thing? This whole golden chance? Like, what did it what did it mean to everyone? Yeah, like the golden chance was like a big factor, like to change Counter Strike in Brazil, like because it, it was the first time that like a team from Brazil would have the opportunity to come to North America and like live here for like six months with like sponsors and like everything paid and they could just focus like on playing and playing the big tournaments, big qualifiers and everything. So like as soon as we, as soon as Fallen released that movie, that short movie saying that this golden chance was about to happen, like the teams in Brazil went crazy and like everyone wanted to be part of it and uh yeah there was a couple qualifiers and some invites and stuff like that and uh, yeah but like i don't know if there's going to be another golden chance but the golden chance was just amazing like falling did a really good job so before you join games academy after they've won the golden chance as their coach what did you like yeah. think about the team from an outside perspective i mean i know you were watching them play you're familiar with them like, yeah. did, did you already kind of have this feeling that the team had potential? Or, like, what, what was your opinion of the team before you came on board? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Like, Games Academy always being, like, a really strong team. And, like, Zeus was doing a really good job as a coach. And uh, I feel like uh, the first... The first lineup, together with Taco and the FNX, they had like huge potential, but they also, together with like lack of experience, so they were like playing a couple tournaments here in North America, and like they were performing like okay, they won a couple maps against Cloud9 and things like that, but I mean the potential was there. I could see that the the players had a lot of talent, and um, yeah, I mean nowadays I can I can see that uh, these guys have a lot of talent and uh, the team has a lot to grow by now. So obviously there was a roster swap at Games Academy, right? After this RGN Pro Series event that you guys yeah. had like a somewhat deep run into. Again, this is before you were on it. Obviously yeah. Taco and FNX get brought on to Luminosity Gaming. Uh, yeah. This is where like Bolts gets traded over uh, and all that good stuff. Um, I mean, how did you feel about this roster swap? Did it kind of... Did you feel like it was kind of rough because like this Games Academy team is starting to build themselves up and now they lose like a couple of key players or did it make sense? Was it understandable? I mean, what was kind of the, the thoughts and feelings about this particular roster swap? Yeah, like at the beginning, because I came together with Boats and Phelps like at the same time, you yeah, know, yeah. as soon as the roster changed. But like at the beginning, I felt like, yeah, they had a lot of team play together and like, and like they were used to play with each other and things like that and the guys were like kind of sad about what happened because the the guys from games academy was didn't had a contract so it was pretty much like luminosity just invited them and they accepted the invite and they just left the team so they were like kind of worried about what, what how it would be the future like if they would manage to bring two players and another coach to and keep performing good but uh, in the end, you know, I feel like the roster change helped a lot, like both teams, like Luminosity, they became even better, like Taku is doing a good job, and uh, FNX as well, and they just won the major, and uh, with our team, I mean, I, I think that I kept doing Zeus' job pretty good, and uh, we're doing great, 
right now, and the boats. I think that boats, like back in the days in Luminosity, he was like playing kind of bad. I don't know if if it was like he wasn't satisfied at doing his role in Luminosity, or if he was just not happy about being there, or something like this. But nowadays, I feel like boats is like one of the best players in our team, and he's really like focus it on playing and and like yeah, maybe he wasn't doing his role back in luminosity and the uh, phelps just like playing really good and uh, he's like uh, playing i mean this guy never played like international tournaments and this and sivo was like his third big tournament like international right. and he's already doing like really good so yeah yeah so now coming back to you, Peacemaker, because again, when I mean, I was obviously watching Games Academy and, and you know Luminosity play throughout 2015 towards the end, and so I was like familiar with the players, watching them play, and like I knew Zeus was the coach for Games Academy, so I was aware of him as well. But I'll be 100% honest, when when Zeus transfers over to Luminosity and Taco and FNX go over to Luminosity, all of a sudden it's it's you know said that oh Games Academy has hired Peacemaker to coach team, and I am like who the hell is this guy? Like I had never heard of you before. Like <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just gonna be real and i think that the same went for phelps too right i mean i had heard on like forums and stuff that you know different people from the brazilian scene had been hyping up phelps as being like the next cold or something like that but yeah. you know obviously I, I didn't really know what to expect but again with you i had no idea so mm -hmm. i know you kind of told me that you were friends with zeus and you no. were studying the game a lot and you were you know watching demos and you know learning about uh, how to play the game and all that good stuff but how did you go from that to like actually being hired as a coach for the team like what was the process yeah like my career was pretty much like i played with all these guys like from i think that i didn't play with fallen but like besides that i played with all of them like from the luminosity guys and the games academy guys in brazil like in another teams so like i knew all of them and uh, especially like lucas and henny we played uh, different games together like crossfire we played counter strike together so we like we knew each other from a long time and uh like I, well, I started to play like in 2000 or something, so I played the game since a really long time. And uh, Zeus is like one of my best friends, and I, I know him for a long time. And uh, like I said, Zeus was like always telling me that uh, like if I have the opportunity to be a coach, he thinks that I would be a really good coach. So it was pretty much like as soon as he got the invite from Luminosity, he was like, Hey, Peace, you want to come in? Because I know you're going to do a good job and you're going to keep doing the job that I've done. And uh, the guys trust you, so uh, if you if you want, you can just come. And then I was working in Brazil, like in, with another staff, and I just quit my job and like came immediately because that was my dream for a long time. Yeah, so I mean, I guess like how I would maybe follow up on that is like, what do you think it was about you that made these guys trust you, or, or what do you think you did to like prove yourself as like a worthy candidate? I mean, was there anything in particular? Was it just because people felt you were like smart about the game because of how you spoke about it? Or, you know, like what was kind of the, like the, the aha moment? Like this is definitely what we want to do, right? I mean, is, do, you, do you have any idea? Yeah, first it was like, nobody from our team like had a, like a good mindset to be the leader. So like they wanted, some someone that was like always being a leader like in brazil and things like that so all, always in brazil I, I was the leader from like all my teams i was the captain so uh, like I, I always did this job and uh, they wanted the captain so they bring me over and like they were like yeah like zeus was doing a really good job i don't know how you're gonna if you're gonna fit in our team you it was like kind of like i had to prove myself you know i had to show them that i know the game i had to adjust to their tactics to their style and all that it took me like some time like a month for two months to like i realize how they want to play how they like to play and things like that well i mean honestly like at the beginning they didn't trust me at all of course they were used to zeus and like you, you know Zeus always did a good job, and I yeah, just had to prove myself. And uh, yeah, now nowadays, like they trust me like hundred percent, and I'm. So yeah, I guess like working. at the beginning when you first came in, when you said they didn't really trust you so much yet, was it mostly yeah. just like like how did they still listen to you? Was it just because like Zeus were like, hey, like you know, give this guy a chance, or was it more of just you know they were just willing to give it a shot, or, or how how was the dynamic there? Actually, yeah, actually it was like. A little bit of both like Zeus knew me for a long time and he was like yeah you should trust this guy because he knows a lot about the game and he's gonna 
keep doing my job and he's gonna keep you guys like hyped and all that kind of stuff and the guys are like yeah we know him for a long time and he was a good captain back in the day so yeah why not let's give it a shot and uh, it worked yeah this yeah i got you so i mean when you came onto the team were you like automatically the in-game leader like right off the bat I know it's changed now, like like at this tournament you had Baltz helping out. We'll get there in a minute, yeah. but for now, okay. like when you first joined the team, were you all, like always the primary tactician? Was that always the plan? Yeah, yeah, I was the, like, every, like, I was doing 100% of the calls, like everything, you know. And like I said, it took me a lot, like some time to realize like how we should play. And, you know, I always been like a perfectionist, like I wanted everything like my way. And it took me some time to realize that things didn't work like that, you know, especially in on my team. So, yeah. I mean, did, was there any particular player on the team that you was like really helpful to you that kind of pitched in a lot or was kind of like a second uh, mind so to speak to to get information from and, and assistance from or was it mostly just all of you all day i think that like one guy that helped me a lot at the beginning was henny because he was like you know he 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 was leading them back in the days as well like to get in another team not in games academy so it was like trying to make me confident you know and like telling the guys like hey we should trust peacemaker like whatever he says we just follow and things like that yeah but in the end you know everyone was like starting to like respect me and listen to me and uh, yeah so what was kind of your like, who did you look up, look up to or what was kind of your inspiration for, like, how you wanted to call? Because when I watched your team play, and, I, and this is still somewhat true, though I think lately you've been a little bit more innovative, and we'll talk yeah. about that in a second. But, like, your base level play, like, the foundation in which you build from, I feel like has been like that that slower, more methodical style that really does look like a Luminosity. It really does look like a Navi type team. I yeah. mean, were those the type of teams that you were trying to kind of model yourself after or or what was that about? Yeah, definitely. You're right about it. <laughs> like I've always been a, like a huge fan from Navi, and I like the. You know, I like to mix things. Like, I, I, like obviously, like Fallen, for me, he's like the best in-game leader in the world right now. So it was like trying to get something from Luminosity, and always something from Navi, like the the play style. But uh, yeah, yeah, you get yeah, it. <laughs> I definitely see it. Like, like for instance, I remember watching one game uh, on Cobblestone that you guys played, and you did that whole tactic where you would like smoke the APC at the top, like the truck at the top of middle, and then you'd yeah. split the B-bomb site by going through the door. And I was like, that's yeah. totally a Luminosity tactic. I've, I've seen Fallen call that before. <laughs> exactly. So, so I mean, yeah. that's just one example, but how much uh, swapping of ideas goes on between you guys and Luminosity? Like I gave an example of how something from Luminosity came over to you guys and you threw it into a game. Has there ever been a time where like y'all have had an idea that like luminosity is kind of embraced or like is there swapping back and forth mm, actually like you know because zeus is also like doing some tactics for them like uh, falling is calling but like zeus as the coach is like always bringing new stuff to the team so it's like pretty much like me and zeus like sometimes we we talk about strats we talk about like smokes and you know everything and uh so we share ideas and like some of my ideas i already saw in their team and you know some some things i just we we just copy from each other it's pretty much like that but like and nowadays i think that luminosity has what different style you know from our team like or my team i feel like we play more like doing like default stuff and like maybe like doing some like robotic tactics like we have robotic stuff we have defaults we have like simple stuff you know we're trying to mix things up and i think that's what's helping us a lot to like improve and things like that and do a lot of, also we do like a lot of fakes you know and let me know see, i don't see like them doing like big fakes you know like big strats they play more defaults so yeah that's how it is right now yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I've seen Luminosity evolve too. Like they had this really quick like cat split on Mirage now on the B bombs that I saw yeah. at the major. So it seems like they're trending towards that. It's, Navi's done the same thing, right? Like they've been trying to get like those faster pace attacks and then mix it up to catch people off guard and yeah, seem to exactly. do that as well. So I'm gonna ask you a question that might be like slightly controversial, right? So I'm kind of warning okay. you ahead of time, but uh, I don't know if you got this perception, but I remember there was this moment. I think it was. This was pretty early in this year, I think. It might have been, I can't remember if it was when you qualified for Malmu or Katowice or, or something like that. It was like some land you qualified for. And obviously, 
you, you guys yeah. like recorded it uh, and it was on a YouTube channel. Like maybe it was even on Luminosity's YouTube channel. And okay. you know, it was all of your team was like sitting in a room and you were playing one of your matches and like obviously falling is like sitting behind you guys as well. And like they're all there supporting yeah. you and whatnot. And when people saw this, I, I feel like they got this idea in their head that like, oh, well, Fallen just must be, like, calling all calling. the shots. Yeah, <laughs> or, or like, Fallen has this profound influence, and that's why they're successful. Obviously, you've proven at an event just now where he wasn't even there that you are you do just fine without him right behind you, right? I mean, you just want a title. Mm -hmm. But I guess my question would be then with all this is how much influence does Fallen have on the team? Like, you know? Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. Like... It was for uh, the Katowice qualifier, probably, if I if I'm not wrong. And uh, yeah, like all since they live like across the street, they always come to cheer for us, and we do the same, you know. But um, like at that qualifier, especially at that qualifier, like Fallen was behind us, like watching us playing, and like at certain points he was obviously like, you know, trying to help with communication and all that kind of stuff. And maybe like uh, when we time out, he was like talking with me giving me some ideas but like he was never calling at all he was just like telling ideas about what he was watching so he was like hey if you do that i think this is gonna work but yeah it's up to you guys you know so then we were discussing stuff and then just obviously like I, I i obviously like took his ideas and bring to the team and then we decided to do it or not but yeah like fallen like nowadays he's not doing that anymore because especially because people like when he did that, like you said, people started to like think that he was calling for us and things like that, and doesn't help us at all. So like we had a conversation with him and kind of told him to like don't do that anymore, otherwise people will think that he's calling and he's helping us, and that's why we're qualifying for the tournaments and things like that. And uh, yeah, like you said, I guess we just proved it that we we don't need Fallen to win a tournament or to upset big teams or things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's impossible for there not to be some influence back and forth. I mean, like you said, you guys are like a family, right? I mean, y'all are all that each other has, you know? I mean, yeah. you live right across from each other. I would ask this, though, like, do y'all have any other people that you talk to or hang out with there? Like, I know, I thought I heard something about CLG coming <laughs> over one time for, like, a barbecue or something. So yeah, I was just curious, like, how much interaction you guys have outside of the team you know if yeah like like honestly here in lancaster it, like there's nothing to do uh, because it's a small city so it's pretty much like what we, we usually do like we, we we travel around like somewhere near like we go to los angeles or we go to somewhere else um but like like you said the clg guys already came here for a barbecue and uh, the guys from luminosity already went to cloud nine's gaming house to clg gaming house me i didn't go anywhere yet but the guys from my team also went to clg you know like we're like good friends from cloud, the cloud nine guys the clg guys also from the liquid guys so it's like whenever there's an opportunity to like you know relax a little bit have some fun and do barbecue and things like that usually do that because it, it, it's good yeah, absolutely so talking about building up this team with, with games academy um we, we already talked about how you got involved as a coach but let's talk about uh the, the two players that came to the team right in place of taco and fnx and the first one's obviously bolt which is a familiar face from luminosity and, and you know yeah. keyed stars and all that good stuff but my question would be this and i guess it would have been easier if i just would ask him this right but i'm sure you could still give some insight yeah, so obviously this dude got removed or whatever from his old team and it was like the best team in brazil right and now he's getting moved down to this team which you know, it's not like you guys are some slouches, but I mean, again, this is, you know, going from the cream of the crop of Brazil to going down maybe a notch, right? And I feel yeah. like for most people that would almost kind of like shatter their confidence or like maybe they would, would kind of feel like, oh man, now I have to go and play for like a lesser team. But <laughs> Bolts, like we've talked about already kind of in, in briefly, he's kind of flourished on this team, right? Like he, look, he looks like the best player on the team. He's very consistent. He performs quite well. He looks good he looks happy um yeah. he's even helping with leading now so like how how did he handle that whole process you know yeah, Does that like make sense? At the, yeah yeah of course like at the beginning he was like really like 
not happy like with, with the roster change he thought about quitting like not playing anymore and things like that and uh then i had a conversation with him and uh i just told him like hey i i know what you're capable of and uh, i feel honestly i feel like you you were not playing your role back in luminosity and uh if you trust me i'm gonna bring you back basically it was just like that and then he was like are you sure about it because i don't feel like i want to play anymore you know back for a less team as you said and things like that and then pretty much like the guys like he he loves Henny, lucas and those guys and you know that he could actually like have a lot of fun here as well like playing for and have playing professionally but having fun as well because those guys from my team they are like really good persons they are really funny guys so and then like we had a conversation and then he decided to give it a shot and uh, nowadays like you said he's just like like the most consistent player in our team and he's like always like trying to bring new stuff to the team and he's like like i i feel like i i managed to bring him back and he's like playing playing his role right now he's playing really good but plus he i feel like he's really happy you know i can I, yeah and actually like back in the days of Luminos, he was a really quiet guy like he wasn't talking at all not doing interviews or anything like that and nowadays he's like doing interviews with me he's talking a lot he's like always trying to like bring new stuff like i said to the team and now he's leading he's even leading the team so i mean it's just it feels really great to see him improving like that so i guess i might as well talk about this now since you just brought it up uh, rather than okay. saving it for later. He you said he's the in-game leader of the team now. So, again, people maybe had some confusion about how the team works. Like, So, explain to me, you know, when it was at the Sevo Gfinity Season 9 Finals and, you know, going forward, how does this actually work? Like, how much of it is you? How much of it is him? What's the kind of yeah. system in place that you two guys have? Yeah, like... Basically, it was like that. After Malmo, we had like a pretty bad result. Like we didn't go out of the groups. So then we had a conversation like about how we should play, and like I, I was kind of like doing some anti strats during Malmo that didn't work out. So the guys like wanted to play more like their game and what we practiced and uh, things like that. And then uh, the, uh, Boats was like, "Yeah, if you would you be able to let let me call for a tournament?" I was, then we decided like to give him a shot, and I would keep helping him because it was his first tournament so like and like i told him i, I felt like as soon as like we play a big team and he would be under pressure i feel like he would stop calling so i was like hey i will give you a shot and if that happens i'll be there to cover you up so and then like during this tournament boats was like pretty relaxed he was calling really good but like under like certain moments like under pressure, for example, in the game against Vitus Pro or during the finals and things like that. Like we, we did a really good job together. Like sometimes I was calling, sometimes Boss was calling or sometimes like the, the even the other guys like Phelps were giving ideas, Henny was giving ideas. It's pretty much like that, how it works in our team. Like because it, it's pretty, it's, it's kind of sick if, if you just one guy calls like and the other doesn't have like space to talk about what's going on on the other sides of map so in our team it's pretty much like everyone has opportunity to talk give ideas and things like that and then it's like boats who decides together with me and yeah it's pretty much like that so you feel like it's a pretty equal like deal between the two of you you and bolts like it's kind of like 50 yeah. 50 at this point yeah 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 pretty much like that yeah okay so I guess we might as well talk about the rest of the roster now before we get into some of your sure. recent results. Okay, so Phelps, again, came out of nowhere, had no clue this guy was going to be. Again, heard a lot of hype from the Brazilian scene about how this dude was like this next up-and-comer. You know, he was going to be the next Cole. He was going to be the superstar player with the rifle. And yeah. then I heard like some rumors, though, that the reason why he hadn't got on a team like earlier than this was, I guess, like attitude issues or, or something like that. Um how did Phelps find his way on this team? And can you tell me a little bit about who he was before he joined the team? Yeah, of course. Like Phelps, back in the days, he was like, like you said, he had some attitude problems. Like uh, people think that, like Phelps usually made his teams back in Brazil. And then he was like famous for like kicking people out of the teams. You know, he was not satisfied. And then he kicked the, the guy out like after one week or two weeks and things like that. And he like, some people doesn't like him and things like that he has like you know he was a really tough person to deal with back in the days and then like when the guys actually to be honest like when the guys bring up his name like to join the team 
I wasn't happy at all. I was like, yeah, I don't know. Like he got kicked from Kid Stars back when they were in Portugal because of attitude and things like that. I don't know if it's going to work out. And then the guys were like, well, this is like the opportunity of his life. Why we don't give him a chance? And then I was like, because he always had a, like a huge talent. He's like a really skilled player. Like he, he was one of the best players in Brazil for sure. Yeah, but I think he's the most skilled player on your team. Like mechanically, yeah, the dude's definitely. insane with the rifle. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. He's the most skilled player in our team, and uh, he he always been like that. You know, back in Brazil, in every team that he played, he was the most skilled player. And uh, well, I, and then the, the, we decided to give him a shot. We bring him to North America. At the beginning, he was like kind of shy, you know, taking it easy, and he wasn't performing that good. Maybe because of that, but nowadays it's like he he's really good, you know. He's he's not having we're not having attitude issues with him anymore. He likes love everyone from the team. We have a good atmosphere, and uh, he's playing really good. So we're just really happy with him. Yeah, so I mean, and he's hit like a new level of consistency at this this Sevo event. It seemed like like yeah. he was just putting up fantastic numbers next to Baltz. That was like your big duo. So it's good to see him developing. So let's move on to Hen One. So you've said Henny at least five times in this interview. So Henny is safe ground apparently. Yeah. I can't tell you how much bickering I get from people on social media when I'm casting a game. They're like, it's Hinny, not Hin One. And then I hear from him, he <laughs> likes to be called Hin One. So, yeah, can you put this to bed, Peacemaker? What is the appropriate pronunciation for all time? There's no more arguments. What, yeah. <laughs> put, lay it down. What is it, Peacemaker? Yeah, it is Henny. It's he Henny. Call it Henny. Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. We're done. Never, never again should I hear anything no else trouble about anymore. this. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I will reference this clip every single yeah. time. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, what, what, did he like Hen One at first, and he just like embraced Henny because everyone called him that, or like? Actually, honestly, he don't care. Oh, he just doesn't <laughs> as long as you, right. for him, it's like as long as you talk about him, he don't care. If you call him Henny, if you call Hen One, he All doesn't right. care. Well, let's talk about Henny, okay? Yeah. Most frustrating opera to watch ever, man. Like I'll be <laughs> hundred percent honest with you. Like his firing speed is insane. He yeah. hits the shots that he shouldn't. Like the ridiculous shots. I think the perfect example we talked about this was some one v two clutch he had on Mirage. I think it might have been against Virtus Pro in the best of five. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. No, I think it was against SK in the final. He, he, yeah, I think so. He hit he was like shot. in van and he missed a shot like plain yeah, exactly. as day on the guy in sight, but then he just like jumps yeah. out of van and hits this nuts flick shot on this dude like yeah, jumping exactly. around the apartments and and then he like misses a knife inside of a smoke and loses the clutch and it's yeah, just exactly. like and I, I was like that is hen one in a nutshell or hen in a nutshell <laughs> like just yeah. this this crazy aim that misses some of the easier shots um i mean is this like a conscious thing that he even realizes that like he has a little bit of trouble with one type of approach Definitely. to taking shots and then struggles with another i mean what what are your thoughts on this yeah, like definitely. We we're, were talking with him like after this tournament, like, hey, you're missing easy shots and you're doing crazy stuff after that, you know. Henny is like, he's not like really consistent in our team. Like, usually it's more like when we need, when we are under pressure and we're like losing a game, somehow, like, sometimes Henny just goes insane and kill like four guys for us and do like insane clutch or things like that. And uh, it's just his style, you know. Yeah. He, he's like missing easy shots, but then after that, when we need him, he just go huge and like kill everybody for us and win rounds for us he, and things like that. I know this is gonna sound like maybe like a bit off, but he he reminds me of like a Brazilian JW. Like he's just that <laughs> wild card. Like he's gonna yeah. come in and make a big play sometimes, and like just make a crazy opening or like make this big play, but then he'll have his moments where he's not really doing a whole lot because the rest of the team is performing. Like, I feel like, you know, Phelps and, and Bolts is like that, that fine tuned duo that you know what you're going to get almost every game. And then like Hen One's yeah. the guy that can just come in and like change the round or like change the momentum with like a super huge yeah. play. Like the first yeah. time I watched some plays when you guys just absolutely shit on Echo Fox in the LCQ, like where you dropped the 40 bomb on Mirage. 
Yeah, I remember that. I mean, that was the first <laughs> game I really like paid a lot of attention to him besides the yeah. RGM Pro series. And yeah, it's just like he, he's a he's <laughs> he's an X Factor player he's for sick. sure. Yeah, like his reflexes and like you said, he's just really fast. You know, and and like you said, his style is pretty much like similar to JW. You know, because he's like really aggressive. He's not like a passive opper. So sometimes he's like. It looks like he's throwing the game because he's always trying to peek and things like that. But at the same time, you know, what can I tell him? Should I tell him to like not peek at all because it's just it's just his style. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But you know, like yeah, just that's just his style. I can I can yeah. stop him. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, it, yeah. it works for fanatics, so I mean, <laughs> it could well, work, well, it work for Henny. Yeah, 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 for yeah. Us. So, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the other two players, the ones that maybe don't get talked about a whole lot. Um, okay. The first one will be Lucas, which obviously uh, Henny's twin brother. Um, yep. I, I feel like he kind of plays an entry role next to Phelps a lot of the time because, like, usually yeah, exactly. Showtime and Bolts are kind of like the peripheral role players. Um, yeah, exactly. I feel like he's actually like he's like had these qu more quiet events, but they've still been pretty good. Um, like I remember at IM Katowice, like he actually did pretty solid. I think he even went like positive for the event, if I'm not mistaken. And then yeah, this last event. I'm not sure where he ended stats wise, but it, it seemed like it was pretty good. Like it seemed like he wasn't crazy behind the other three guys that we've already talked about. So it seems like his development has also been actually pretty good. Uh, can you tell me a little bit of, just about Lucas? Like you know, yeah, sum course. him up for me. Yeah. For example, Lucas was a really tough guy to deal with at the beginning of the team because he wasn't listening at all. And uh, after that, we had like conversations. We talked about what he should get better, you know, his mistakes and all that kind of stuff. And nowadays he's like, you know, performing really good. He's not like the star player, like you said, he's not bringing like that 40 bombs and things like that. But in the end, he's like really consistent as well, like like Boats, for example. So for me, having a guy like Lucas in the team is really important because he's consistent and he's like always like, Doing, for example, on B side on cash, he's not doing entry role at CT side. He's like being a supporter for Showtime. So he likes. He's a really good guy to adapt to different styles. You know, if yeah. I need him to be the lurker, he can do that. If I need him to go and be the entry killer, he can do that. If he wants to be, to be the supporter, he can do that. So yeah, it's just really good to see how he's improving, and uh, it feels really great to have him in the team. And he's doing a good job. For me, he's doing a good job. He doesn't need to kill 30. 30 kills like every map right so obviously we'll end here with the last member on the team which is going to be showtime and i know okay. this guy did catch a lot of flack from this past event because while the event started out really well for everyone i think everyone was positive going into the semifinals like so the group play when you guys played uh, sk and dignitas like everyone came out of those series like with some type of yeah. positive rating and then after the best of five and against VP, that's whenever some people's numbers started to fall off a little bit. Then, uh, you know, the finals against SK, I know Showtime particularly had a rough game on that Dust 2 match. Uh, that was yeah. one of the games where I think, you know, you really noticed some struggles there. Uh, obviously, peripheral yeah. player, secondary opper, uh, you know, his roles are pretty clear. Uh, what, why do you think he sh struggled a little bit at this event towards the end? Any <sighs> Like during like during our practice during the boot camp that we did before this tournament, he was playing really good. I don't know if he felt like kind of pressure because we hit the semifinals and it was the first time that he was playing semifinals for a big tournament. I don't know if he felt like a pressure, but you know, Showtime, he's like a young kid and he's like doing a role that I usually did back in the days in my teams. He's like the second upper and he's like the lurker. So you know, it's pretty hard because I'm trying to, like, uh, help him doing this lurker role and things like that. And that's something that we're really working on to make him perform better. And uh, he has a lot of potential. He he has talent. The talent is definitely there. And we're working on him to, to get him, you know, make him play better. But, you know, we're satisfied with the way he's playing. Like, most of the – like, he, he, had, he definitely had a bad tournament. And he knows that, you know, he uh, at least that's that's what made me happy. Like we had this conversation after the tournament. He was like, hey, I know that I didn't play my game. I didn't play it really good, but I'll be back in the next tournament. I will play better. And he's like really focused. And that's what really matters for us. And he, he's a really good guy. Like I would say like he's the like re he's a really calm guy, you know, maybe the the best guy to deal with in the team like he is always listening and things like that so it's also important to have a guy like that on the team and i'm pretty sure that he's going to be back and he's going to play better in the next tournaments 
Okay, I think it's a pretty good sum up of him. So I'm gonna kind of rewind really quick with one quick question before we go into like results. And okay. this is this is going back to like when the whole Taco FNX thing happened, right? When they get the luminosity. Okay. So I feel like there's almost this this feeling out there now that that Temple Storm was almost like a farm team for Luminosity. Mm. Like the moment that Luminosity yeah. needs a player, something's not working right. They're gonna yeah. look to you guys. Maybe they're gonna pick up like a Phelps, you know, or bring Bolts back. Like, it, or what if Fallen retires and doesn't want to op anymore, and all of a sudden you need an opera on Henny. the team? It's gonna be <laughs> Henny, right? So, yeah. is is that like a concern? Is that like a real thing, or do you feel that both rosters are, are fairly stable going forward, and we shouldn't see any like you know mixing of the teams anymore anytime soon? Yeah, like. Honestly, right now I feel like most, like both teams are really stable right now. I don't see Falling stopping or any of the guys like getting kicked or like stopping him to play at all. Uh, but like in the future, like definitely like if they want to bring someone to to their team to Luminosity, they would probably like look in, in your team and like for example, if Phelps is playing good, they would probably try to get Phelps. Or if Falling stops to play, they would, they would probably try Henny. But you know, the problem that happened before was that the Games Academy guys didn't have a contract, so it was just pretty much like invite him if he wants to just go. But nowadays we are under contract, so it's not easy as that anymore, you know. And then, so. Yeah, you never know like what what could happen in the future, but like if if even if that doesn't happen, there are a lot of talents in Brazil and like really good players in Brazil. So maybe you can bring another guy that nobody knows and nobody ever heard of, and he's gonna be the new Code Zero. You never know. <laughs> also, that's actually another question I could have really quick. Then I uh, wasn't yeah. planning on it, but you led me straight into it. Is is yeah. there like another player you can think of that could be like another Phelps or could be another Cole? Is there another hidden gem out there in Brazil? Is there in like Brazil? a name that you can come up with that you would? you know, say, yeah, this guy's also going to wind up being really good? Or, or is there, like, a handful of players that you would say that about? Or, Yeah, of course. Well, in my opinion, uh, there is a guy called Destiny. He used it to play in uh, Kate Stars in Portugal when they had that lineup together with Phelps. And uh, Destiny is a guy that I, I know him for, like, one year or something. And he has huge talent. I think that nowadays he's playing for – he's still playing for Kate Stars, but in Brazil – it's the same lineup with Knack, Bit, you know, the old former mm -hmm. players from MyBR. And this guy has a lot of potential. And, uh, yeah, maybe he, he's going to be the next one. Okay, cool. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, I guess first tell me this this whole acquisition by Tempo Storm. Like, how did that come about and, and what did that do for you guys? Like, um, sorry, what, what did you say? Like, I, I couldn't hear you. I guess, question. like, how did how did the Tempo Storm thing happen, and what has Tempo Storm done for you guys? Like, how has it helped uh, you? Okay, like, it was, like, after two months that we are, were here in North America, and then we qualified for the Katowice tournament, and I think we qualified to Malmo, and we were in Tempo Storm. And then, uh, and then it was pretty much, like, Reynold came to us, and, like, Obviously, like after we qualified for those tournaments, we got some proposals and things like that. And then Reyna, the owner for Temple Storm, came to us, and like he's a really good guy, and I I knew him like back in the days. And uh, yeah, then we just decided to join Temple Storm, and uh, we we're really happy with the organization. And he they have been doing like everything that we need, and yeah, we're just really happy. Right on. So obviously, you guys made a big name for yourselves within the North American scene. Uh, a couple of months ago, and this was uh, basically just through your tournament play, because obviously you guys weren't involved in any of the pro leagues yet, uh, and I guess yeah. you still aren't, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, we're not. We'll, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that later. All right, we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. Uh, okay. But you did play in some tournaments against some of the top professional teams, which included uh, the IM Katowice qualifiers, which you were the only team from the Americas to qualify for that, because you beat up everyone like liquid clg yeah. cloud nine, cloud nine in the finals, Na name yeah. your team you wrecked them all i mean i guess there was some close games against cloud nine in the finals like an even an overtime game includes so, i mean it wasn't like a complete blowout but you still you know <laughs> yeah. just ran through all of them uh and you were the only team to qualify from the region because of that and then obviously the malmu qualifiers weren't too long after that where you guys once again you, you beat echo fox you beat optic you beat cloud nine again um yeah why do you think you were 
like how, why do you think you were just breezing through these teams like was it them not playing well was it you playing really well combination of the two like what what do you what do you think was going on during this period yeah actually i think it was like kind of combination of the two because they had like all of those teams had like roster changes recently and uh, i feel like they lost like key players and uh, like for example cloud9 lost shangaris that was the leader from the team and the captain and everything and uh, i feel like it was a little bit of both, you know, and I think that back, you know, since they were a new team and we were like playing a lot of tournaments and like practicing really much. And uh, we also did like some really like good anti strats and things like that. Things just worked really good at those two qualifiers. And uh, I think that that was a huge factor that we managed to win against all those teams. But uh, yeah, nowadays, like... For example, nowadays they did another roster changes in like all of those teams. So you, I don't know how they're gonna play, like how they play anymore. I don't know how they're gonna perform anymore. You know, I feel like that that has been a problem with the North American scene. Like they are doing the, those shuffles and changing lineups and things like that. And I think that kind of helped us to qualify for those two big events. So on online play, keeping on that topic. Obviously, CLG eventually kind of caught up to you guys, right? They beat you in that I Buy Power Spring Invite tournament. Yeah, that's true. Uh, in, a, in a, like a, a closer series, and then they also beat you in one of the SIBO qualifiers and eliminate you from you know one of those events. Um, obviously, you wound up getting invited anyway, and you wound up winning the whole tournament. So I guess you get the last <laughs> laugh. Uh, but I guess my question here would just be, why do you feel like they caught up to you? Or like, did, did you guys like just slow down a bit, or? Uh, did they just get better? Combination of the two once again. Like I'll, I'll give you the, yeah. I'll, I'll let you stay on the fence and not pick a side if you want to. But just, just curious, why do you think CLG actually finally started getting some wins? Yeah, definitely. Like I'm gonna pick a side because I don't like to stay like that. <laughs> so uh, I'll be honest. I complete. I'll be completely honest. Like after the Katowice tournament, that we we did pretty great. Like we go out of the groups, and then we play Navi on that big stage and things like that. And also at the ML, MLG that we almost qualified to the major and things like that. I feel like our team like kind of slowed down a little bit. We were like too much relaxed, like not practicing as we should practice. And you know, we were, we just relaxed it too much. And uh, that was definitely one of the reasons why they caught us up. But uh, also together with that, I feel like CLG was working really hard. And I, I feel like nowadays, for example, they are playing really, they, they are still playing really good. And uh, they are like doing boot camps and always trying to improve and not changing lineup and things like that. So yeah. Yeah, I've always heard. All that. I've always heard from other teams. I mean, like obviously the Brazilian teams, yourself, Luminosity, have always been known as being like the really hard workers, the one that put in a shit ton of time, and you you had that reputation going for you, right? But I had always heard that out of the teams that are actually from the United States or Canada, that CLG was the one that really put in the most time. Uh, is that the same perception that you have? Like, cause I know you practice against all these like, all these guys regularly. Uh, is yeah. that the kind of vibe that you get from them in comparison to other teams, or, or yeah, what? Uh, I, I yeah, I think so. Like especially after they bring Pita as the coach, I think that they improved a lot. I don't know, like, w what is Pita role in the team, or what is he doing? But he actually I leads feel them. like he's there yeah, he's the, he leads the team. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty much like what happened with NIP with Fred calling, what happened with our team with me and and Boats now calling, and you know I, that's. W probably one of the reasons why CLG is performing really good now. Like, Pita is probably doing a really good job, and like you said, they're putting a lot of hours into the game. So, I mean, I, I don't let my opinion, like, you know, influence you, but I've always felt, like, outside of the Brazilian teams, that CLG was, like, the most tactically sound of, of all the North American teams. Is that true, or do you think there's, like, another team out there that you, like, whenever you play against them, you are, are really impressed by how they approach the game? No, I think that they are the most, like, the yeah, they do like a lot of tactics and things like that. Yeah, definitely. Is there any other team though in the NA scene that you kind of are impressed by when it comes to their strategy mm. that you would add to the list? I mean, we know that Liquid and Cloud9 are going through like leadership changes. Like, yeah, right now, exactly. So hard, hard to hard to factor that in. But just if there's anyone else that you notice that you like, Splice was actually doing a really good job. Like after they qualified to the major, we had a couple of tournaments against, like a couple of practice against them, and they seemed really good. Like I don't know if it was GRT, the coach, that was doing a really good job as well. But yeah, like the North American seems to seems to be like you know, 
uh, like learning how to play the game, you know, mix tactics with default stuff, simple stuff and things like that, you know. Yeah, I think that I would definitely go for a splice. Okay, cool. So you've been tearing it up online, right? Already, already talked about all that. But then the MLG qualifiers happen, and it started out not too shabby, right? I mean, you did lose to Gamers 2, but it was a close Dust 2 game. Uh, yeah. you, you beat Selfless, no problem. But then you got ultra stomped by Flipside Tactics. Like, sorry, I hate to, like, <laughs> make it sound bad, but it, it was pretty yeah. bad. So what, what happened here? Like, how did you miss out on the Major? Like, how did, how did this happen against Flipside? Yeah, first of all, it was like, at the Gamers 2 game, I, we feel like we, we kind of troll the game because I think we lost like three or four Ecos, like almost in a row. So we kind of troll the game. And uh, yeah, we, we, we after that, we had like conversations about the mistakes that we did, that we shouldn't make mistakes like that anymore. And uh, well, we had a good win against Selfless. And then going into the match against Flipside, it was basically like we didn't do what we practiced and we wanted to play like their worst map instead of playing our best map. In that case, for example, our best map was Cobble and we decided to play Cash against them, which was a huge mistake because like like I was watching the stats and I saw that they didn't play Cash at all. So I was like, yeah, they will probably be on uh, one map and then we pick Cash and we're going to have a comfortable win. But I was totally wrong because Cash, and they proved that, that they were, th that was a map that they were working on to play the Major. So they caught us off guard and, uh, uh, and uh, like at the train game, which was the, I think it was the first map. Also, I, we tried like anti-strat stuff that didn't work out, and I would say that it was my fault because I, I, we, I didn't let the team play where we practiced. And I was trying to like just do anti-strat stuff, and that didn't work out. And yeah, the, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So like, obviously, after this, people are like, "All right, maybe these guys aren't legit. Like, maybe I mean, not legit, like saying you're cheating or something, right? But like, maybe these guys aren't the real deal. Like, maybe they're getting overhyped a little bit." But then you guys did go on the IM Academy to very quickly after the MLG qualifiers. It wasn't too long afterwards. And, I mean, in group play, you're beating EFRAG, you beat VP, you beat Envy. So you're beating some some good teams. Uh, and then you play Navi in the playoffs, and you get a map win off of them on Cobblestone, which they were, like, one of the best Cobblestone teams in the world. And you yeah. are able to get the, uh, the overtime win there. You, you're very competitive on Mirage. You only lose by three rounds. Um, obviously people will like, add the caveat that, you know, Guardian was injured and that that's fair enough, right? That does weaken Navi a bit. You do have to add that context, but in general, I would say it was still a pretty good performance from you guys. You, you can't take that away from you. Um, and you know, why do you feel that you fared better here as opposed to when you just got crushed by flip side in the, in the qualifiers? Like what do you think changed between the events that helped you out? Actually changed a lot. Of, we changed a lot of things after that. Like we, we knew that we, like we should have played our like the or best map instead of like trying to anti strat them and things like that. So going to Katowice, we were just like, yeah, we're gonna veto and then we're gonna try to play our best maps and doesn't matter if it's against VP, if it's against Astralis or whatever. And then at Katowice, it was a little bit like both things, like it's good anti strats together with like doing what we practiced. And uh, also, I think that uh, since like the, the European teams never played against us, I think that they had no idea how to, how we play and things like that. And honestly, I think that they kind of like you know kind of respected us. Like, yeah, who are those guys? I've never seen them before. So yeah, let let's just play against them. And I think that we call like VP off guard. Envy off guard, and I mean, we almost won against Australia as well. Like we made 12 rounds on them on one of the best maps, which is Cash. So, yeah, I think and going like against Navi, for example, even though Guardian has injury and things like that. Like, in my opinion, we had the game in our hands in that best of three, and we, and uh, we just throw it on Mirage because of lack of experience. We couldn't know like how to finish the game, and uh, yeah, and uh, I think that that that's what one of the reasons why we perform good in Katowice. I mean, how did it feel to get the wins you got, though? Like, whenever you got these map wins off of VP, Envy, and Navi, I mean, what did that do for you guys? Did it, let it like, help your confidence? Did it, you know, like, yeah. how, how did you guys feel about the tournament whenever you left? Honestly, it? like, that helped us a lot. Like, we, we I, actually, like, we we think that we could have won against Envy us on Mirage because it was a good map for us. And uh, we've, we watched a couple of demons, and they were struggling on Mirage recently. But, like, playing against VP on Cabo and winning, like, comfortable like that, 
just gave us a lot of confidence and also even though we lost for Astralis we made 12 rounds so the guys were like super hyped and then as soon as we went out of the groups we were just like really confident playing against Navi even though we knew that Navi was one of the best teams in the world maybe the best team in the world together with Luminosity and things like that and uh, yeah but like don't go in uh, into the match against Navi, we were just like super confident, and we even played a map like Overpass that we never played before. Like it was, I think it was like the first time that we played Overpass at all was against Navi during like the quarterfinals in a big tournament. <laughs> we performed pretty good. Because you banned Train, yeah. I'm assuming, right? Is how Overpass yeah. got through. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. We banned Train and got Overpass. That's always been like the kryptonite, right? With your map pool is the fact that you only get one ban Overpass and Train have both kind of been on the weaker end. But we're gonna talk about Train in a little bit because I think I think. Yeah. Uh, we did see you do a little bit better there uh, at SIVO. Uh, but then you did have DreamHack Malmu before our event uh, not too long ago. It was just uh, in April, so like middle of April, I think. And yeah, you obviously, again, beat Envy, this time on Cobblestone. Um, but then you lost to VP on Mirage. They kind of got a little bit of revenge on you, I guess, from your map went on Cobble and Katowice. And then even though you beat Envy in groups, you wound up losing to them 0-2 in the actual best of three. So... Can you maybe tell me, like, what do you think was different between when you could beat him in a couple of best of ones in, in these land tournaments, but then when you had to play him in an actual best of three, you weren't able to beat them? Like, is there a reason for that that you felt? Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, again, going against Envy, it was like we won 16 14, if I'm not wrong, on the first map on Cabo in a best of one. And uh, we felt like we should have lost that game. And then in the end, like I had a good read and uh, like uh, about what they should do in the in the last round. And then we we managed to win the game. But like in the end, like going into that best of three series, like we I think that we chose Dust Two instead of picking Cabo, which was like it was like one of the maps that we feel really comfortable at. So we decided to pick Dust Two to kind of like try to surprise them. And I think we just did that like. A bad decision, you know. It was all about like do doing a bad decision. We lost us too. Like we got pretty crushed. I think it was 16-9 or something. And then going into against them on Inferno, I feel like we kind of didn't play our game. We played like kind of bad. Like we, we were hitting B site on on Inferno like a thousand times, and we didn't know how to go A. You know, it was a little bit like lack of a. a good tactics to A, and that's something that we talked about that we should, uh, you know, work on for the next tournaments. Yeah, so let's get into SIVA. Let's get into the, the last kind of portion of the show before we just kind of maybe briefly talk about your team's future. Um, okay. So first of all, I know that you guys had talked about that y'all did a boot camp before the SIVO event, uh, I guess, in Sweden, yeah. right? Yeah, Am exactly. I correct about that? Yeah, um, in Sweden, Stockholm. So can you tell me a little bit about this boot camp, like what you guys were working on, what, what what did you use it for, how did it go, things like that? Yeah, well, our boot camp in Sweden, I think we boot camped there for like nine days, nine or ten days. And uh, well, it, it was really good because we it was the first chance to play against the best teams in the world and to practice and see how they play and see how they practice because that's also really important. Like how and, and after that, like after I think it was like after three days boot camping there, we already saw like a lot of things that we should do and we should improve and things like that. And going into this boot camp, our main goal was to like improve our map pool because uh, we felt like our Cabo was a really comfortable map, but we had to like improve our map pool play another maps like for example train and uh cash as well that we were struggling a bit mirage and uh, yeah and uh, that was our main goal and uh, also we wanted to like try boats as in-game leader so that that helped like doing the boot camp helped us a lot to see how boats perform as the in-game leader and things like that and uh, yeah we just had a really good boot camp so let me ask you this, um, outside of a boot camp, which is kind of like a special situation, right? It's like an, an extra effort being put in the preparation. Uh, what is just a normal day of practice like for you guys, like when you're in the United States? Like today, for example, you're obviously about to go to DreamHack Austin. What What is a typical day of practice? Like how many hours is it? What do you actually do? Like just give us an example of how your team prepares, yeah. right? Yeah, of course. Like at the beginning of the team, we were practicing like seven, six, seven, eight maps per day. That's a lot of maps. And nowadays we kind of changed our mind. Like we prefer to do like maybe three or four maps per day, but do it like properly, you know, really like f 
focus it, like try new stuff and you know, studying what we're doing. And then after that, we watch the demo, see the mistakes we did and things like that to discuss things. We feel like it's better to like play four maps in a good way than playing like eight maps and like not learning anything for those eight maps. So That's when you say we, that, uh, like you mean like you're playing like four scrimmages? Yeah, and then exactly. you watch back the demos of the scrimmages afterwards. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like we we like we play like four maps, and then I go and watch the demos, or we have like a discussion to s talk about what happened, what we should improve, when the things that we should change. And it, if it was a good practice, then we just go and relax a little bit. You know, we're not like practicing a lot of hours because at least for our team, it, it seems to don't work like at all. Is there a lot like an individual practice outside of that, like DMing yeah, exactly. or like watching yeah, demos the guy, or whatever? He, he, yeah, like the guys love to play FPL and that kind of stuff and play like screams and things like that. So they are playing like the entire day, like individually and death mats and of course. So like what's your schedule look like then, like on a typical day? like for, On a like... typical day, actually like what I'm doing right now is like watch demos, watch all demos from Sivo, see what the mistake we did. But like usually I'm like watching demos like watching official matches that's going on like live live matches from Europe and things like that or like doing uh, like new tactics and things like that that that's what I've been and and also like uh, during the practice I'm coaching so so it's like before practice starts you would do all these things you just mentioned like just now and then like practice would start you play all your scrimmages and then you kind of have like a debrief after the scrimmages are over uh that yeah, talks exactly. about what went happened okay so that's pretty cool i think people are always kind of curious like you know what, what teams do? Do, do they yeah. fo do they focus more on scrimming? Do they focus more on like dry running tactics and coming up with new strategy, or do they focus more on demo review, or it's like a combination of all? And it seems like there's a pretty like you know even combination of many things for you guys. So it's pretty cool to get some insight there. So let's like yeah. get into the the event itself, right? So obviously you guys open the event um, against SK, where you dealt with them. I mean, fairly easily, it seemed like. I mean, you had uh, this crazy uh, win on train where you had, like, this really big CT side, but then you kind of struggled to close a little bit there at the end, and then you just, yeah. like, wiped Cobbler. It was no problem, 16 to 6. Um, first of all, I would just ask, because this is, like, a constant theme throughout the tournament, so I guess I might as well propose this question now because it happened a couple of times against Dignitas and Virtus Pro as well, is that actually this particular event, it seemed like your CT sides were a bit stronger, which was odd because it seemed like you were more of a T-sided team from like watching you play previous to this event. Yeah. And then, so there was that issue, like the CT side seemed better, the T side seemed weaker. And then it was also just the issue of closing the game, you know, seemed to be a constant problem. Like you yeah, have a big sense. lead and then you'd struggle to like end it, you know, finish the job. Uh, yeah. Can you talk to me a little bit about like maybe why your CT sides seem like stronger of than course. your T sides this event? Yeah, of course. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, in our boot camp we were really working on the CT sides, especially because we knew that or we were like a a good team playing T side, but uh, uh, when we go into CT side we were struggling a lot. Like that happened in Malmo against Envy and that couple match that like we made a huge t, t side and then. Uh, at this side we couldn't finish the game and we almost lost the game because of that so that's something that we we learned from Almo and we're really working on during the boot camp and i think it was like this the boat calling as well i think that also kind of helped us to play on the city side he's he was like uh, telling the guys what they should do and things like that. He kind of organized the team, you know, a bit, maybe a bit better than me on the city side and that's worked pretty good what about the issues struggle, like struggling to finish games? I think you brought this up yourself uh, yeah. a little bit earlier when you talked about how you couldn't close that game on Mirage against Na'Vi when you played him at IEM Katowice. Well, now here yeah. we are in the Sivo event, and there were certain maps where it felt like you did struggle to close the game. Um, yeah. I think particularly the ones that I remember the most was that train game against SK, uh, but also there were a couple other games just throughout, like maybe the Dust2 game against SK uh, in the Grand Finals was probably oh, another yeah, example definitely. of this. Um, why do you think that's the case? Like, Is it something that you consciously see is a problem, or, or, or what do you think about this whole issue struggling to close matches? Yeah, I actually think it's like, the, the teams are definitely playing good. I mean, uh, we can take, like, you know, like, if it was our fault or something like this, they're obviously, like, trying the best to bring it back. So, like, during, for example, during that SK match, we we obviously made a huge city side, and going, for example, T side, 
we tried like all our tactics and and like anything didn't work like we couldn't do anything and uh it was we, we were kind of lucky that we made like 14 rounds in city side so we had two more rounds to close the game but sk was playing really good and and like definitely like after the match i really told modi that he, they, they played amazing and then yeah and uh for example going into sk again on dust two match i feel like we struggle like we did mistakes that we shouldn't do like communication problems and like also like some misreads from me and bolts that like actually made them go back come back and bring the overtime and things like that but that's something that we're definitely it's a problem in our team we have to like work more like to finish match more comfortable, just like SK did, for example, during the event, like they lost for us, and after that they like pretty much clo like crushed all their opponents until the finals. So like that's something that we're really working on, and I think like maybe in the next couple of events, maybe at the major, we'll be better. I got you. Uh, so obviously at this event you won your first really big best of three, uh, and the next game you played against Ignatos is like you actually beating a top ten team in the world in a best of three. Obviously yeah. you've taken maps off of top teams at Katowice, Malmo, but now you're winning a complete series. Um, how did you feel about this game against Ignatos? You know, like you know, how, how did your team feel about it? How do you? Why do you think you were successful? Yeah, we were, first of all, like, going in against Ignitas, it was a team that we practiced a lot during the boot camp, so we knew their style, we knew how they play, and, uh, like, we feel like the map pool, or map pool kind of helps us again, going against them, and uh, I think the first map that we played was Mirage, and, uh, yeah, we just played really good, like, we practiced Mirage against them before, um, and then we played against them on Cabo, which was a big surprise that we lost like we were very confident and uh you know, you know this tournament was kind of strange because Dignitas won against us on Cabo and then they got crushed the other day by by SK on Cabo and then in the end we win against SK on Cabo <laughs> so you know it's just counter-strike you know anything <laughs> can happen <laughs> you know anything can happen but um yeah going against Dignitas we, we were just very, like very confident right so you obviously won that series again a big series win uh, it means that you, you know, get first seed out of the group. Uh, Dignitas House actually wants us getting eliminated by SK later on, which is like another yeah. really big surprise at this event. Uh, and then yeah. you guys go on to play a best of five against Virtus Pro, and you guys have never played a best of five before, I don't think, right? Not even online. Yeah, never. You've never played a BO5. So, yeah. first of all, just before we even talk about the match itself, like, how did you prepare mentally for playing a best of five? Like, knowing it could go five match, you could be there for six hours. Like, how were you able to, like, prepare your team to have that stamina, you know, to be able to carry it throughout the entire series? Like, did you consciously try to plan for that? Or, or, or kind of, you know, tell me a little bit about that. Like, honestly, after we won, like, against the Gnitas, we went back to the hotel and uh, we were waiting for our opponent. And then as soon as we realized it would be Virtus Pro, like we played against Virtus Pro a couple of times in another tournaments, like so we were like, yeah, Virtus Pro is a really strong team, and we have to just like relax, you know, take a good sleep, wake up tomorrow, and like talk about what we what we're gonna do and things and how we should play and things like that, and that's what we did, and uh, but like I was like, you know, you know, I was like watching demos from VP and like. Like I said, I, I I'm I'm a guy like like I'm always watching demos and I'm always watching like the replays from our matches to see what the mistakes we did. So like since we played against VP a couple times, uh, I was like, yeah, this time we have to beat them. I mean, I felt that I was 100% prepared. So then me and Bolts had a conversation about how we should play and things like that. But I I didn't expect to go into five maps against VP definitely. Like, and uh, I think that going into that match, one thing that kind of surprised me was that they banned Cabo against us. I think that they kind of respect our Cabo. And then when we, we were not prepared to play Dust2 against them, but you know, Dust2 is a really good map for us. So we had a comfortable win. And, uh, and then we, I think that we won, it was Cash, if I'm not wrong or no. No, it, it was, was like you, you won. It was Train, it was, it was train. train. Yeah, 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 another big yeah, Train we, game. Yeah, Train, we, we, I think that we did like, we, since, like I said, we worked a lot on train during our boot camp, and uh, it was to, a little bit like yeah. Watching yeah, train was so surreal, man. Because like we know Virtus Pro is like this really powerful T side train team. Like they're yeah. one of the best train teams in the world, and it was like you guys were just bullying them. Like 
you know, Lucas or Phelps would just like push ladder room and just like wreck people, or you push T Cantor and wreck people, or Phelps would like flank ladder, go inner halls and wreck people, or Showtime would push inner halls and just like wreck people. Uh, I used the word wrecked like seven times right there, but it's true. Like you guys were just pushing everything. You were really aggressive. You were in their face. It almost yeah. looked like you guys were Virtus Pro, right? Like you, you were the one that had this crazy. And it was the same way on the yeah. T side. Like on their T side, they looked so timid. Like they weren't really attacking well. Even after they took a timeout, they didn't really make an adjustment. It felt like they were just trying to do the same thing anyway. Meanwhile, yeah, when it, you were on the T side, you were doing like that classic VP stuff, like just grinding out these heavy, fast outer executes, to, like right to close out the game. So, uh, like, like you said during your boot camp, you worked on train a lot. Like, what, was that the case? Like, you were working on trying to find more aggressive setups, uh, like to change your style, or like what were y'all planning on train all along? Actually, yeah, like it was a little bit both. Like we, we were trying to adjust, like we were trying to play more aggressive, especially against VP because we, like back in the days, we always played like passive against them and that didn't work out. So for this turn, we were like, yeah, we're not gonna give space for them at all. We're just gonna play aggressive and see how it goes. And uh, it was a little bit like anti-strats and things like that together with playing aggressive. And like, yeah, I guess it just worked out pretty good against, uh, against them. And uh, together with that, I think that VP kind of didn't play their A game during this tournament. You know, I think that they struggle a little bit against us, uh, especially on that train map. I think that they didn't play re really good. Like, like right. I said, like you said, it's it's the best map from them, and uh, I think that they kind of struggle a little bit. Right. So obviously you like two O the series, right? Oh, you're you're two O ahead in the series at this point. But then Inferno rolls around. You guys just get destroyed. <laughs> it was rough to <laughs> watch. Class. Because a lot of people thought that maybe you just three of the series, right? You have the two O momentum. You're, you're like you've beat these, this team comfortably on the two maps. Obviously, Dust Two not a good map for Virtus Pro, so you can kind of give them a pass on that. But then you just beat them on Train, and now you're going on to Inferno, which in the NA scene has been a great map for you guys. Uh, mm -hmm. VP, it's it's not like one of their favorite maps. Like again, they're more Train, Mirage, Cash. That's kind of their big trio. So Inferno seems a little bit outside. They're they're strong in the map pool. Uh, what happened, man? Like, how come you couldn't 3-0 the series? Like, what do you think? Yeah, like, on Inferno, like, VP, like you said, VP completely, like, outclassed us. Like, uh, we didn't know what to do. And, uh, like, VP played, like, very aggressive, pushing B side on CT side, pushing A, and doing things that we are not used to. Like, we didn't play against any team that did what they did against us. So, yeah, that's true. yeah we, we, like, even though we, like, we timed out and we were talking about what Snacks was doing on B side, we couldn't find a solution to, like, you know, go through the, those smokes and kill Snacks and things like that. And I think Snacks played, like, really great. And, uh, yeah. I mean, the entire team played really great. And that's the problem when you deal against Virtus Pro, you know, they have a lot of experience. And even though you were like 2 0 in a best of five, I feel like that doesn't affect them at all because they've been together for so long and they got like so much experience playing together that like they didn't feel pressured at all. And they proved that like on that Inferno map and then after that on Cash. Right. So then you guys wind up losing Cash in a really close game, which obviously Cash a big VP map. I would say it's like towards the middle of your, your map pool, like obviously Mirage, Cobble, things like that are a little bit higher up there. Um, so now you've gone from being 2 up in this series to now being all square at two apiece. So basically your lead's now gone. Everyone's even. You're going into map five on Mirage. So like my question would be this. It's like I feel like a lot of teams in that position would maybe lose a little bit of mental composure, especially a team that's never played a BO5 before, never has been through like that long and grueling of a series and – hasn't had very many series wins against top teams. You only had one, you know, prior to this. That was against Ignatas early in the tournament. So mm. how, how do you think you were able to keep it together on this map five? Yeah, like after it was 2-2, we went, uh, I, well, like I had a con we had a conversation and, and then I was telling the guys like, hey, this is our tournament, this is our moment, we can't let it go like this. I mean, even though we just lost two maps, just forget about the past and let's go to this Mirage map. And uh, going against them on Mirage as the last map, 
kind of helped us because we played Mirage against them in Malmo and like they played like the same way as they did in Malmo and we knew the mistakes we did in Malmo like I said we watched the demo and we knew what we should do to beat them if they play like that and they just played the same way and they got punished for it that's pretty much like this I remember Phelps like kind of saved y'all on this map I felt like because he, I think he had like this crazy round where he like had the tech 9 he killed an opera in CT spawn and then he picked oh, up the yeah. op and had like that crazy quad kill yeah, uh, that's so I feel like I feel like you guys did actually struggle a little bit here on the T side, but then like someone made a, yeah, a, a crazy play. Um, I think Bolt had some big plays as well, like right around the same time in, in the half to like bring it back. Um, you know, so I mean, like I guess throughout this entire process, were like all the players like handling it really well? Were they like kind of shaky, or was everyone just like you know really confident? Like during the match after the city side, I don't remember how it was this or city hall against them, but still, like I, I remember this this play that you you're talking about. It was Phelps that like killed the guy with one shot on city spawn and then bring the up and then it was like yeah, he was it was a key round for us to bring it back, but like. The problem was like, especially in Malmo playing against them, we had a good city side and then we struggled on T side. This time, I think that we made like a decent city side. I think it was eight seven or something or seven eight, and then going to C side, I think we lost the pistol and then we bring it back. Yeah, you know, we, we were like very prepared to play against them on T side, and uh, yeah, together with like some really good performance from Boats and Phelps, Henny, and yeah, we that helped us a lot to to finish the series. So I have like one like kind of odd question, I guess, like maybe this is irrelevant, but I remember at one point in this game, like Phelps took the op over Hen1, or Henny rather, uh, and it wasn't even a situation where like he had the better spawn, like he actually took the op in Palace or something weird like that, and Henny just like played it a position with an AK. Was there any particular reason this happened? Was like Henny just like not feeling confident with the op anymore, or was like Phelps just wanting to keep it to try to make a play, or like why? Yeah, exactly. It was pretty much like Phelps trying to do like his play. You know, sometimes he's taking the op and trying to do like something to surprise our opponents, but you know, nothing special. Okay, I'll just leave it at that then. So you guys obviously go on to beat VP. A very emotional moment for your team. Uh, I know Showtime was kind of in tears after this, which I mean, yeah. I'm not making fun of them for it. Like, obviously, this oh, is like a, a huge thing, right? You yeah. made you, you made your first finals. Uh, you won another big series against a top team in the world. Uh, yeah. Like, what was kind of the environment for the team at this point, knowing that you were about to go play a grand final? Yeah, like after that moment, it was just like really special for us because like it was the first time that we we hit the finals and uh like you you know like after that like we we were just like very confident because winning the series against virtus pro in like a best of five you know it was just like really special for us and uh like going into that sk match like we were just like very confident and like very prepared to face against them especially because they played like in the group stage against them well yeah it was i think it was like a a key factor for us to to win the tournament so obviously you play sk in the grand finals you've already beaten them before in group play but after that sk like went on like a pretty big tear like beating you know teams like they, they three owed hellraisers in the semifinals they beat dignitas so they they were looking hot oh, yeah. players like Madi were really looking good freeze is looking pretty good with the op pimp had a couple of big games so they, they were looking like improved like by a lot since when you had played them in the initial stage but then you guys go two up in the series, like you win cash, like really convincingly, which was like not expected. Uh, and then you guys won dust two in overtime. Yeah. Uh, first of all, like I guess my first question would just be like, why do you think you dominated them on cash so hard in the first map of the series? Like on cash, I think that we, like against SK, I think that they played like quite bad. I think that it was their peak. It was, yeah. I think it was cash, yeah, yeah. So like cash was like we we made a very good city side on cash, and uh, I think that we had to like to do like a, like a few rounds on this side, so we pretty much like had no problem to close up the game. This time at least we didn't struggle, like you said, we usually struggle to close up matches, but this time we we played really good. But I think that it was a bit more like, you know, they struggle to play cash against us. I think our style, you know, maybe they were trying to do some anti strats and uh, that's something that we kind of expected, you know, like going into that match, we kind of expected that they would try to do anti strats against us. So we were like trying to do some, you know, new stuff to kind of try to surprise them. And I guess that did, 
work out pretty good. So you obviously lose to them on Mirage in Mountain 3 of the series. Yeah. And SK also beat Luminosity on Mirage at DreamHab <laughs> Leipzig back in January. Is yeah. SK just the Brazilian answer to Mirage? Like they have the answer for Brazil on like is there some weird thing going on here or why do you think you guys, you know, didn't just 3-0 the series on Mirage? Yeah, I mean, SK just played really good on Mirage and I think it's a good map for them against Brazilians especially. <laughs> but uh like like yeah, like I don't know what to say. Like we we played like kind of, kind of bad like they had that mid control and we couldn't do anything to like stop them even though we tried several times but it didn't work out and uh i feel like yeah just like huge credit for for them to playing really good so obviously the last map of the series is cobble and you guys win that pretty convincingly like you get a big t side you close out pretty easily on ct side you've won your your first final just tell me about that moment man like what was it like just oh. finishing the series here yeah, it was just crazy. Like going into that map at Cabo, the third, the fourth map, um, we kind of expected them to play like totally different from the first day since we faced them on Cabo. Uh, so we were like prepared for everything, and we. But the most important thing is that usually, like when we are under pressure, we try to don't do what we practice, and then going against them again on Cabo, we we were just like very relaxed you know and we were like always telling each other hey we should do what we practice it doesn't matter if we lose this map we go to the last one on train you know let's just do what we practice and then we should be fine and uh yeah it just worked it so is good. that like just you i guess battling against second guessing yourself or overthinking it kind of because like like you said you've played them on Kabul before you yeah. know you're like you've won on Kabul before and you're thinking to yourself oh well they're obviously not going to just do the same thing on Kabul. We just crushed them, so obviously they're going to change, so we have to as well. So is it just like trying to find the like the balance between making adjustments and then like just sticking to the game plan and not overcomplicating things? Like how do you make that decision on whether you should adjust or whether you should just, you know, yeah. stick with what you, what you know works? Yeah, that's something that I feel like our team is improving a lot. Like we're tr starting to like adjust to our opponents, you know, instead of just like keep playing our game and don't do anything, and then in the end we just lose matches. You know, that's something that I feel like after like these tournaments, these big tournaments that we've been playing together with the boot camp, that's something that we're starting to learn. And like I feel like our team is really good right now to adjust to different styles, and uh, like. That's why we, like you said, we just decided to like stick to our plan, play where we practice, and if we have to adjust, then we should do, then we would do that. Like even if we have to time out the game, and like do things that we didn't practice, we would, you know, we would be prepared to do that because it been it, that's how we we played the entire no tournament. You know, adjusting things and, right. and it's been working pretty good. So like. Uh, I think we already talked about all the players and performances earlier when we ran through the whole roster, so not too much yeah. to say there. Obviously, the big trio of Phelps, Baltz, and, and Henny played really well. We already mm -hmm. talked about Showtime and that whole thing, so we need to go on that. But And you already kind of, I guess, gave your thoughts on one of the event. So um, sure. I guess the one thing I wanted to ask, ask really quick before we just talk about the future of the team is I, yeah. there was this one particular thing I noticed on Dust2 where you did this um, – you did two things that I don't see very often. So one I've never seen before, which was the double run boost, which you used on uh, pistol, pistol round, I think. and an eco round yeah. as well. I think you yeah. use it in both series. Uh, you use it against VP and SK uh, in both those us two games. Uh, so obviously pretty innovative. Never really seen that before. Uh, and yeah. then you also use like a lot of teams will drop CT spawn. But they'll use it to like attack the a bombs or like you get like on slope and you like find a new angle on the corner opera, uh and it just like adds another route to your attack on the a bomb side. But you actually use it to split B, um, yeah. and so that was like another like thing that you just don't see very often. Um, I mean, who came up with this stuff? Like, how did this stuff get innovated? And do you have okay. any other cool things up your sleeve for later? Yeah. <laughs> well, like first of first of all about the pistol, I think it was a bolt who bring up that thing and uh it was a like we always thought that maybe we should if we do that 
kind of stuff like boosts and things like that like we we have the opportunity to like if the guy is watching catwalk if if, the, if he's not he doesn't have like reflection like to you know kill the yeah, guy yeah. jumping you know because of the boost so it was pretty much like a boat's idea and uh we've been practicing that during the boot camp and it worked pretty good and uh after that we did the jump to city spawn you said right that, that, yeah, that we yeah basically it was like uh, it was, I think it was on overtime that we decided to do that yep. because we, we knew that they were playing like a guy on city spawn, the other guy was on B alone and they were like playing 3A usually so we have a strat that we usually go, we hit A with like a lot of smoke, mollies, flashbangs and all that, so we decided to fake that strat, you know, do the same thing and then just jump to the city spawn and go to B and then we it worked pretty good, but it was my idea. You know, we, we actually we do have that strat, but it didn't use it for a long time. And I think that since, like like I said, we are just to our opponents, you know. And uh, well, uh, about uh, having something on our sleeves, you will see at the major, <laughs> at the minor qualifier. At the major qualifier. Okay. Yeah, major so, qualifier. Yeah. So you got some cool stuff. I, I heard yeah. this weird thing from. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about this. This is just like random. Uh, Fallen was mentioning something to, like maybe Anders or something on Twitter I saw the other day about he's cracked the code for CT side cobblestone because like a lot of people complain that on cobble and they fairly by the way that it's hard to get information on CT side to like rotate accordingly or uh, like have a good proper CT side cobble which is a lot of the reason why it is so T sided. Um, yeah. I mean, are, are you aware of this? Uh, is it something that you guys know about as well? Uh, is it something special that we, we uh, that we have to prepare for? Something new? <laughs> Actually, I have no idea. I, I didn't oh, hear okay. about it. <laughs> but you know, yeah, like definitely, like city side on Cabo is a really like maybe like it's re it's really hard to play because you never know if you have to play 4b if you have to play default like 2a 3b you know it's just really hard we're that's something that we're still working you know to find like how we should play uh, like even though we played really good this tournament you never know like the next tournament we can get crushed on city side you know it's really hard to deal with yeah i know what you're going to be doing once this interview is over like hey fallen what was that that ct cobble thing yeah exactly yeah i'm gonna ask actually i'm gonna ask him tomorrow <laughs> so uh let's wrap up this interview by talking about the future of tempo storm so obviously we're recording this like the night before you're about to travel to dreamhack austin uh, you are going to be there as well as Luminosity. Of course, some of the big top North American teams will be there as well, such as CLG, Cloud9, and Liquid, Energy, uh, you know, a couple other names in there. And Splice is going to be there. I'm trying to see who I forgot. I'm sure I forgot somebody. Uh, sorry, I didn't have the groups pulled up in front of me. Um, <laughs> but uh, with that in mind, I know that you and uh, Luminosity are obviously the favorites to make it to the finals. Y'all are in separate groups. Your group is Liquid, Selfless, and Energy. Their group is CLG, Cloud9, and Spice. I forgot Selfless, so that's the one I forgot. Yeah, um, I mean, how are you feeling about this event going into it with uh, with how you did at Sevo and like the prep you've done in between events? Like, I mean, are you feeling like you should make the final again? Like. I don't feel like we should make the finals for sure, but it, uh, we feel like we are very prepared, you know, like we're really confident since we just won this tournament. And I feel like the teams will probably be like a bit scared to play against us. You know, that that's how it goes. Like when you play like a team that just won a tournament, you, you obviously like be like a bit scared, you know, to do some stuff, you know, you respect them a bit more than maybe you should you know things like that but like going to the tournament we were just like we didn't have like anything prepared you know since we just came back from london like two days ago two, yeah, two days ago so we didn't prepare anything special i think we're gonna just stick to our plan you know play our a game play where we practice in in uh, during the boot camp in sweden play how we played in Sevo and like i said just adjust mm -hmm. and obviously if we if we go out of the groups we'll probably face a really good team because the other group is like lg cloud9 clg if i'm not mistaken and the last one is i don't remember who it is yeah but still you know four good teams so we have to be prepared first of all to for the semi-finals if we go out and then if we have to if we have to play LG in the final it's gonna be a, like a crazy match and I think the world is waiting for this right yeah we want to like, see it <laughs> 
Yeah. Exactly. You guys yeah, teased yeah. us with this show match you did, but then you mixed the players. Yeah. It's like team exactly. piece. I was like, come on, like this is. Yeah, yeah. we gotta do a Tempo Storm Luminosity Best of Five one yeah. day, man. Yeah, um, that that would be a a bit sad for the NA fans, right? Because the tournament is in North America. If they don't have like a North American Peacemaker, team, come on, you don't finals. give a shit. You want to go to the finals? <laughs> and you want to beat Luminosity? Yeah, come on. Just don't don't worry, don't worry about all that pity stuff. There's there's no need to no need to do this. No need to make me feel better because I'm North American. Just let it go. Right. Uh, but right. I will. Two questions about Austin, really quick. So first question is: I don't think you've ever played Energy before. I know that's your opening game. Uh, any worries yeah, or concerns true. about playing a team you haven't played before? Or are you like, well, you think you're well researched on energy? Or, or what are you thinking about this particular matchup? I know you've played Liquid and Selfless before, uh, even though Liquid's gone under some changes since then. Uh, same with Selfless. Like when you played them on land, they were still using Kusta. Um, so there's definitely been some swaps there, but like energy's the one team where you, you've had no experience playing them yet. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we have to be prepared. Like, Especially because we never played against them, we can't just like unrespect them totally. You know what I'm gonna do is I'll probably watch some demos. Not like I'm gonna do anti strats or anything like that, but I, well, I mean I'll make our team like pre be prepared for this match because you never know. Like uh, like you said, we never played against them. What if what if they bring something new that we're not like ready for, and then we lose on the first match would be like really bad for mm -hmm. us. So. Well, it's one of those things where you know God B's been watching all of your stuff, like from Sivo, and he, he's he. There, For there's sure. No, there's no doubt that he has been sifting through all yeah, of the definitely. files. Yeah, definitely. is a really so. good leader. I mean, yeah, yeah he's. So. He, I mean, even though they're a new team as well, but I think that they didn't change lineups since they made the team, so they they will probably be really prepared to face us in in that best of one. Right. Uh, so then, my next question about DreamHack Austin is: If you do play Luminosity in the finals. Can you win? Can you beat Luminosity? Is it possible? Definitely. I mean, we feel like it's going to be really hard. I mean, it, it depends like about the maps. Like we kind of know what map they're going to veto and they know where veto is as well. So it's going to be like it will depend of the map of the maps and how our guys will perform, you know? Because like we never played against Luminosity before, so you never know You've if the guys will feel pressure. You've never played each other before in practice. Yeah, exactly. What? No, in, no, in practice, uh, yes. Oh, okay. But you know, practice are practice. <laughs> we don't take practice serious. We're like during official. You don't matches, take practice serious. Uh, is, oh. NA, has NA gotten to you, Peacemaker? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> no, no, no you I'm need to about. leave right away, bro. Don't do this. <laughs> no, but right. like you know, we don't take like results, practice results as something that you know we yeah, should yeah. take. Yeah, you know what I mean. Okay, now so, I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Makes but sense. like, yeah. So like, you know, we didn't play officials against them with this lineup before, so you you never know. But I think it's gonna be like a really tough match. We're gonna be like super prepared, like especially for me and for the guys. We're gonna be like super hyped to play against Luminosity. The guys really want to do this, to get to the finals against LG. And I think it's going to it's gonna be a matter of like who plays better, you know, together with like both teams trying to anti-strat each other and things like that. And uh, yeah, it's going to be like crazy, crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be <laughs> pretty insane to watch. And I guess yeah. after DreamHack Austin, your next focus is the minor, right? To try to get qualified for the... Yeah, uh, after after yeah, after Austin we're going to play ESEA finals, the Premier Finals, if, which is going to happen at uh, 15th May, if I'm if I'm not wrong. It's like one and, day long though, right? Yeah, exactly, one day long, yeah. And then after that we're going to play the yeah, we're going to focus total for the mirror qualifier and uh, we'll probably start to you know, think about our vetoes again because we're gonna probably have to play Nuke in that in that minor qualifier. So then we have a lot of stuff to do. Like we're gonna have like one week or maybe a little bit more, but still, we have a lot of things to take care of because we we can't let this opportunity <laughs> go go out again. You know, we have to take this. I hear you. Um, yeah. So outside of DreamHack Austin and the minor and focusing on the major, is there anything else like on the horizon for you guys? Like uh, you know, is there anything else that you have planned? Any like future things that you're going to participate in that you know of now, or as of now, you're not really sure. 
No, actually, like after the minor qualifier, we don't have any plans. Like the only plan that we we have right now is like after the minor qualifier, if we if we qualify to the major, then we'll probably play the major, and then we'll probably go for like vacation. We'll probably go to Brazil because we really miss our family, so we'll probably go there for like 15 days or 20 days, and then we'll probably come back and and start to play the tournaments again. But nothing for now. So I know that like if you guys win ESCA Premier, you should become a part of the ESL pro league so you finally would get in one of the big pro leagues um yeah. any thoughts on that or i mean is that something that you guys want to be a part of or yeah of course like that that was our main goal when we arrived in north america like we have to go to ESA premier league mm -hmm. and uh like we will take even though like we're gonna probably play like lower team levels like you know but still we have to take that tournament really serious because we can't miss this opportunity right so I guess the last thing I'll do before we just do like final thoughts and shout outs and stuff like that is yeah. obviously the whole ECS thing happened, right? Where you guys didn't get invited and you guys couldn't play in the qualifier because it was scheduled so last minute and you guys were, I guess, I think you guys were boot camping or you were playing DreamHack Malmu or like one of the two things was going on. So you were in Europe, yeah. so there was no way you could participate. And like I said, it was like really shitty last minute. I know Selfless got tossed around a lot trying to get their thing going. Uh, I know a couple others. I think Renegades also couldn't attend because they were like in Australia getting visas, and so they couldn't uh, participate because they weren't in the country either. And so it was kind of just like a sloppy qualifier process, yeah. right? I guess that's the best way to put it. Maybe I'm shooting myself in the foot by like calling out a big league like that, but I mean, it yeah. is what it is. I, I think I think enough people have put out information out there that it's very hard to read it any other way that it wasn't handled properly. It seems like they're running smooth now that the season's underway and they're playing games. Uh, I think it's been fine at that point, uh, but yeah, definitely a, a rocky start, but I don't know if you want to even comment on this or where you want to take this. So this is even really going to be a question. This is more just going to be like an open forum for you. Like, is there anything that you would want to say about this whole situation? Yeah. Like, obviously, like we feel very disappointed that we couldn't play like one of, like, I would say like the biggest league that ever happened in Counter-Strike, it's this one. And, uh, you know, for us, it's not like about the money, but it's like it would be a, like a big opportunity for us to play like such a big tournament. And uh, obviously, like the guys felt really disappointed. But, you know, I didn't really know like how they invite those teams, you know, how it works. But we feel like we definitely should be there. But, you know, if it wasn't this time, maybe that's 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 because we didn't deserve it or maybe because, you know, it doesn't have to happen you know we'll take it easy like with the, right now we're really like we're not like sad about it anymore we're just taking things like easy letting things happen and uh if we if we keep playing like this i'm pretty sure that we're gonna be in the next season yeah sure i mean that's a that's a good nice optimistic way to think about things yeah. there was this one other question that related to this really quickly um i know like a lot of like pundits out there were saying that oh like you've created pressure on yourself by going out and saying you deserve to be in this one league and you didn't get invited so well now you really you, you really better prove it because it would look kind of embarrassing if like you're complaining that you didn't get invited to this one league but then you go out and you like bomb out like at a tournament or something like say you would have like yeah. say you get eliminated in groups at SIVO right uh yeah. do you think that your comments or thoughts on the whole ECS thing added pressure to you guys to like prove yourselves that yeah we really do are in this spot or did you not worry about it at all it wasn't a big deal no actually we didn't worry about it like uh, of course like probably like the ECS was probably ashamed because they didn't invite us right now but not like we we do care about it like right now like when we're playing tournaments we just like 100% focus to play the tournament and like focus on our opponents we're not thinking about ECS or any other tournament at all like for sure all right. Well, uh, I think I pretty much asked all the questions that I had, and we, we talked about the team. I think you know we, we covered some cool history. We covered some recent stuff. We talked a little bit about the future of the team. Team future does look quite bright. Uh, are there any final thoughts, comments, shout-outs that you'd like to do here at the very end? It's, it's open to you to say whatever it is you'd like before we close the show. All right. Well, first of all, like I want to thank you for the opportunity to make this interview. I think it was really great. Uh, I feel very happy to to be here. And uh, also, I want to thank Tempest Storm for believing in us and doing everything what they're doing for us. And uh, our all, our sponsors, Curse, G2A, Twitch. And, uh, well, thanks to all our friends in Brazil for the support and all the people that cheer for us, North American fans, the fans around the world, everyone. 
And uh, yeah, uh, we hope to have a really good tournament in Austin, and uh, we hope that maybe we go to the finals against LG and make everyone happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we appreciate you, Peacemaker. And again, guys, thanks so much for tuning in to this uh, episode of The Hype. If you'd like to follow and subscribe for more content, you can definitely hit the subscribe button up top on YouTube. Also, give it a follow on the social media as well. You can see the social media down there below for me, at Dustin Brent. Also, give a follow over to Tempo Peacemaker because he was gracious enough to uh, sit down with me for an hour and 40 minutes with I. You know, definitely would not want to plague upon anyone, but Tempo Storm, uh, <laughs> Peacemaker here, was willing to do it. So, yeah, again, thanks for tuning in and catch you next time.